Thank you, everyone. So there's a report that shows that we are losing more species in poorer countries compared to developed countries. And most of these poorer countries are in the tropics, uh, where over 50% of our biodiversity occurs. So what actually happens in these poorer countries obviously have huge implication on global biodiversity conservation. My approach to solving this problem is to work with people and not against people when it comes to biodiversity conservation. And this is why. I was actually born and I grew up in wildlife protected areas in Ghana. And this is a picture in Mole National Park. And it was a lot of fun um, running around with these large creatures. Um, sometimes they chase us, something, you know, it's just really fun. And so here, um, I really fell in love with nature. I, I definitely wanted to spend my life with animals. My father was a park warden, and his job was to keep these animals safe. And the way he did his job was to make sure he arrested hunters who illegally came to the reserve to kill these animals. And then he would prosecute and put them behind bars. Now, these hunters were from the rural communities around these protected areas. And we didn't like them because they were killing our friends and they made our father's job very difficult. But this perspective changed a little bit. Well, it changed actually <laughs> when I was seven years old. Um, when I was seven, uh, my father um, died, he passed on. And so we were compelled to move from the comfort of these protected areas to now go and live in their communities. And whilst in their protected areas, we had aid, we had food, so we're okay. But then we went to live with this, <laughs> in these other communities, and life was really tough. It was very difficult to find enough food to eat. I mean, you were never assured when the next meal was going to come from, or when it, even if it would come in the first place. And um, I realized that these people that we didn't like, we thought they were poachers, hunters, and all that, were normal people. And, and most of the time, they knew the risks of going to these wildlife protected areas. They knew that they could be arrested, they could be shot, and they could go to jail. And for some of them, the simple motivation for doing what they did was to feed their families. And I wouldn't consider somebody who risks his life to save his family a bad person. But because I knew that conserving species was good for them in the long term and good for us, I knew that I needed to do something about it. So fast forward 20 years later, I'm a young conservationist, and my passion is to work with these people and not against them to save species. And so I came up with a strategy and that strategy is called conservation evangelism. And basically, how I define conservation evangelism is trying to ignite passion in people based on their people's own religious belief system. And the way it works is that I simply obtain a talk time within the religion's already organized program and using scriptures or Quran verses or you know, hadith, I try to reason with them uh, the need to conserve species. And usually when I do conservation evangelism, my goal is to get people to a point where they ask what I consider the most critical question, which is what must we do to be able to save species or the environment and the planet. And I think this is very important in that many times when people come to our communities and they think they've analyzed the problem that these people are poor, so give them an alternative and let's save the species. But from my experience, it doesn't always work because if you give him money or some other opportunity, he will still secretly go and hunt or destroy because it's an additional source of income to him. It's not really an alternative source of income. 
the point is that the local people, as poor as we may be, still need to come to a point where they want to do something. They want to sacrifice. They want to give something to be able to save uh, species and the environment. And that's where we begin to use all the science of protecting species. So I use this simple approach to save my favorite species, which is the Togo slippery frog. This very special frog is purely aquatic, and the local people call it the whistling frog. This was a rare opportunity when, you know, that one person, when he jumped out of the stream to grab something to eat. And they call the whistling frog because of And that is how this frog calls. Imagine this call coming from a stream and not on a tree or something like that. Really amazing frog. And uh, it's very important that uh, we know that this frog was considered extinct for like 40, almost 40 years, and it already discovered. So here we got a real opportunity to be able to save this species. Now some more background information. We find this frog only here. So that's the map of West Africa. Highlighted there is Ghana and Togo. And on the boundary with the Republic of Togo, that's the only place that you can find this frog. And this is why I always like to be the Togo slippery frog, because it lives in this beautiful place, right in the waterfall. And things that are very important for its survival are usually the forest around the streams. Once it's gone, it cannot survive there. So when we discovered this frog, we realized that it was in trouble. Uh, these are photos taken in 2014. It's the best we could get. And this is a man here who is dissecting one of these Togo slippery frogs uh, for food. Um, and indeed, this is a real big problem now in West Africa, where thousands and thousands of frogs are being killed and sold in the local markets. So we needed to do something about this. Another challenge was the destruction of the repair area. The trees were being cut. Eventually, the forest was you know, going one tree at a time. And so I knew that I had to put a strategy in place. And that was when I thought about conservation evangelism. And the reason conservation evangelism was so good for this community was because they were just very poor. And I could relate to that. And there were issues of mistrust within the community. Uh, there were lots of politics. You either aligned to this political party or the other. But they were very religious, and they trusted information that was coming from their churches and mosques. And so I decided to use conservation evangelism. And it's really very simple. I just arranged to go to church on Sunday, and then I listened very well to the sermon, and then I make sure that I have my message within that sermon, beginning from what the preacher said that day, and try to make it all fit into a nice conservation story. And people are always touched and they want to do something. I do the same thing when I go to the Islamic uh, mosque. There are lots of um, scriptures in there that say that be nice to animals. If you are nice to animals, it's like being nice to you know, a human being and all that. And we reason these things out. And usually people will come to that point where they say, what must we do? And that is exactly what we've done with this community. So not only have we been able to stop hunting, where we've not stopped it completely, we've reduced it up to 86.5%, people's willingness to eat this frog. And it's a hard choice for them to make because when these people describe how the frog tastes and its benefit for their immunity, it's not something they will want to give up very easily. But that's exactly what we've achieved in five years. I enjoy a very huge community support. The chiefs and the people like what we do, and I've been very supportive. And even more importantly, we have been able to protect some of the last remaining habitat of this frog. Most of these lands were donated by local people. Some were donated by local churches. We started with 847 acres, and we are expanding to 10,000 uh, acres this year. We've not just protected the whistling frog. 11 other IUCN species occur in this forest, including pangolins and monkeys and endangered plants. And so we are very excited about it. 
And the good thing is that I don't even need to police this protected area. The local people want to do it. If somebody go to cut a tree, he faces the wrath of the whole community. And this way is very sustainable. So my conclusion here is that, yes, it is possible that we can achieve conservation targets, even in some of the harshest economic um, situations. We can do that. And the way to do it is to work with the people and not against the people. And in doing this, I think that patience and innovation is key. We've used religion, but yeah, it's not the only way. There are many other ways, and we need to find that particular uh, strategy that works. So thank you very much.